when there is a generalized anasarca, we usually suspect that probably this patient is suffering from nephrotic syndrome. And you will frequently find such type of patients in your clinical practice. Okay? So you should know about the details of nephrotic syndrome. Nephrotic syndrome, say that, that is a solemn child. And that is, you, you are seeing, that is puffiness of the face. There is a, uh, that is the eyelid or solen. There is also generalized anasarca. So in a case of solen ch children, first uh, you should think whether this uh, child is suffering from nephrotic syndrome. Now come, nephrotic syndrome is a clinical syndrome of heavy proteinuria, hypoproteinemia, edema, and uh, hypercholesterolemia. So, uh, due to heavy proteinuria, there is hypoproteinemia. That is, serum albumin will be low, less than 2.5 gram per dl. And another important thing is protein uh, and creatine ratio will be more than 200 milligram per millimole. And there is edema because oncotic pressure will be less and uh, uh, subsequently, hydrostatic pressure will be more, so more fluid will be shifted from the uh, intravascular space to extracellular space. So there is edema. As well as there is hypercholesterolemia. So if you get these features in, in, a, in a patient, then you will label it as a case of nephrotic syndrome. And now comes to the classification. You all know there is uh, main classification is primary or idiopathic, and there is also secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome. In case of idiopathic or primary cause, there is actually no known etiology. And most important cause is minimal change disease in children. Besides, there, there are also other causes, that is, Focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, and congenital nephrotic syndrome. These all four are in this group of primary or idiopathic causes of nephrotic syndrome. And uh, there are also secondary causes of nephrotic syndrome. In case of systemic disease, most important is SLE, annex swollen purpura diabetes mellitus. Besides, there are some infective causes like post-infectious glomerulonephritis, hepatitis B, syphilis, and also malaria. They may cause also nephrotic syndrome. There are some drugs that may cause nephrotic syndrome like heavy materials like penicillamine gold. There are also some toxin causes of nephrotic syndrome like food allergy, bee stings and others. So first you have to differentiate whether this patient is suffering from primary cause or secondary cause. Now comes to the pathophysiology. That is in case of primary disorder, there is a glomerular uh, uh, basement membrane siloprotein is, uh, there is a loss of glomerular uh, basement membrane siloprotein. Subsequently, loss of normal negative charge and increased glomerular permeability of protein, resulting in massive proteinuria. So subsequently, there is a decrease in serum, decrease in plasma oncotic pressure, and the fluid will be shifted from vascular to interstitial space. And there is a contraction of the plasma volume. So this pathophysiology is very important to understand the main uh, features of nephrotic syndrome. So uh, you, must, uh, you must be clear regarding this. Now comes to the clinical manifestation. As already we have mentioned, main features is generalized swelling, that is anasarca. It also involves the periorbital swelling, scrotal or bulbal swelling, ankle or leg swelling. And due to fluid retention, patient gains weight. There is also ascites, and also there is a um, complaints of abdominal pain, malaise, diarrhea may, may occur, and there may be 
a respiratory distress if patient develops pulmonary edema. Now, uh, what are the symptomatology? An early sign of nephrotic syndrome is from the urine and a scanty urine from the urine at presentation proteinuria usually more than two gram per square meter surface area per day or a urine protein creatine ratio will be more than two so this is very important and there may be orthostatic hypertension and even shock may develop in children because already we have seen in pathophysiology there is volume contraction because oncotic pressure is less and so more fluid will come out from the vascular space to interstitial space subsequently there is orthostatic hypertension even renal perfusion will be decreased so a patient may uh, even present with shock in adults uh, pressure may be normotensive hypotensive or maybe hypertensive there is oliguria even acute renal failure can develop because of hypovolemia and diminished perfusion here you are seeing there is a vulval edema is total swelling and there is a generalized swelling that is anasarca these are the features now comes the meticulous history history is very very important whether this uh, generalized swelling is first time or relapse from history you have to you have to clear it and what about the distribution of swelling whether it starts from the face or abdomen or leg distribution whether there is any color change whether there is any bee sting and whether it is painful or painless so you have to uh, uh, you have to clear from this history taking whether patient is gaining weight whether there is any breathlessness and whether there is any diarrhea and what about the urine color whether it is a frothy urine past medical and drug history whether there is any history of asthma allergy or recent illness whether patient is taking any steroids and there is also family history also important so from history you have to clear many points this is very important now comes to the physical examination first you have to assess the hydrational status of the patient whether there is any dehydration or overhydration whether patient is hypertensive whether there is any perfusion especially in the hernia scolan perfusion in the whether in the buttock or in the legs or in abdomen whether there is any abdominal pain joint pain during examination you have to look for this in case of systemic lupus erythematosus there may be malar rash or generalized there may be mouth ulceration there may be photosensitivity other features may be there so you have to you have to look for all these features whether there is any uh, crepitation over the lung field due to um, say due to fluid overload if you give more fluid or due to hypoalbuminemia so uh, you have to look for the lung base palpation and percussion of the abdomen also important to assess whether there is a ascites or any masses liver enlargement is present in several multi system disease like systemic lupus erythematosus infection polycystic kidney disease and glomerular sclerosis so you have to look for any organomegaly mainly any hepatomegaly or any other abdominal mass now comes to the main uh, uh, etiological cause that is the minimal change of disease that is a um, uh, most important cause of nephrotic syndrome in children is minimum minimal changes diseases it is more common 80% of the children's uh, main cause is this minimal changes mains are more sufferer ratio is 2 is to 1 and it usually mainly present under the age of 7 years you have to look for whether stress sensitive nephrotic syndrome where it usually do not progresses to renal failure often precipitated by respiratory infection so precipitated infection is also an important cause and other features that is age between 1 to 10 years no macroscopic hematuria normal blood pressure 
normal complement levels and normal renal function. So these changes you can get in minimal change diseases. Other causes of nephrotic syndrome in primary uh, primary causes, as we have already mentioned, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, as well as congenital nephrotic syndrome. In case of focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, 10% of nephrotic syndrome in children are, suffer are suffering from focal segmental causes. It usually it progresses from minimal change diseases. It is it may be a separate entity. Circulating factors that increases glomerular permeability to albumin is important here. In case of membranous nephropathy, only 1% of causes is membranous nephropathy. But most of the adult causes is due to membranous causes, membranous nephropathy. It is common in adolescent and children with systemic infection, hepatitis B virus infection, syphilis, malaria, toxoplasma, and drug therapy. Here you will get, you can get hematuria. But in case of uh, minimal chain diseases, usually there is no hematuria. In case of congenital nephrotic syndrome, clinical nephrotic syndrome present during the first three months of life, two types, one is finished type and another is heterogeneous group of abnormal, abnormalities. So this four is most uh, common in primary causes, that is minimal chain disease, focal segmental glomerular sclerosis, membranous nephropathy, and congenital nephrotic syndrome. Now, what are the complications that can occur in nephrotic syndrome? They are, they are very much prone to infection. So there may be a spontaneous bacterial peritonitis, cellulitis, and bacteremia. It may be due to streptococcus pneumoniae or due to E. coli, gram-negative septicemia can occur. And due to steroid and immunosuppressive therapy, tox immun immunosuppressive toxicity, these patients are very much prone to develop infection. As there is hypovolemia, you can get abdominal pain, patient may feel pain, faint, cold peripheries, poor pulse volume and hypertension, and there may be hemoconcentration due to fluid uh, leakage outside the muscular space. A low urinary sodium that is less than 20 millimole per liter and there is a high packed cell volume, you can get it due to hypervolumia. Now, these patients are very much prone to develop thromboembolism. And also, by the by, in this COVID situation, these, those patients who are suffering from uh, moderate to severe disease, they, are also, they also develop um, uh, thromboembolism, uh, extensive thrombosis in the uh, vasculature of the lung as well as other sides. And this nephrotic syndrome, they are also very much uh, prone to develop thromboembolism because it is hypercoagulable state due to urinary loss of antithrombin and uh, there may be also thrombocytosis. There may be, and this thromboembolism is exacerbated by steroid therapy and increased synthesis of clotting factors, increased blood viscosity from the raised hematocrit, this is usually arterial, but may affect the brain, limb, and splanking circulation. There may be also renal vein thrombosis can occur in this, in this situation. And also we have mentioned there may be also this lipidemia, hypercholesterolemia can occur. There may be acute renal failure in some cases. Now, uh, what differentials would you consider in a case of nephrotic syndrome? There may be cellulitis, orbital or periorbital, that may come in differentials. There may be anaphylaxis, so after bee stings and others. There may be angioedema and uh, other causes of hyperalbuminemia, that is transient proteinuria, virtual orthostatic proteinuria, and glomerular abnormalities. So these may come in the differentials of nephrotic syndrome. Now, what investigation would you advise? First and most important investigations is routine urine examination. You will get a, a deep stick test, uh, you will get proteinuria. And even on uh, uh, subsequent tests, you will also get proteinuria. That may vary from mild to 
moderate to severe. And if you can do that is uh, protein and uh, uh, that is creatinine ratio will be more than 200 milligram per millimole in the early morning. The albumin uh, and creatinine ratio more than 200 milligram per millimole. Serum lipid, you will get this lipidemia. Total cholesterol, LDL cholesterol will be high. And C3 level, sensitive uh, and specific uh, other than the minimal chain diseases. C3 level may be, uh, may be decreased. And in case of full blood count, hematocrit may be raised. WBC, in case of infection, there may be neutrophilic leukocytosis. In case of uh, renal profile, they say if you do the creatinine and urea, that will be normal in minimal chain diseases. Serum albumin will be less than 25 gram per DL. Urine analysis and quantification of urine protein excretion. There may be abundant hyaline cast, hematuria, other than uh, other minimal chain diseases. And in case of sodium, that is less than 10 millimole per liter in hypervolumia. So by urine examination, you have to differentiate whether it is a case of nephrotic syndrome or acute neuronephritis. In case of nephrotic syndrome, you will get much more proteinuria. And in microscopy, you will get, say, hyaline cast and uh, other, other uh, acellular cast. But in case of acute neuronephritis, you will get less proteinuria, but more RBC. And in microscopy, you will get, uh, that is, RBC cast, granular cast, but usually not, no hyaline cast. So you can differentiate by simple urine examination whether it is a case of nephrotic syndrome or acute neuronephritis. Other investigations, you can do the complement level and if the if complement level is decreased, then uh, that may suggest other than minimal chain disease. You can do the throat swab and ASO titer. You can do the hepatitis B and TZ if there is any history of jaundice then you have to suspect whether uh, these are due to the viral causes. So other investigations depends on the suspicion, on the high degree of suspicion of secondary causes. Now, these are the terms that you should, um, uh, you should remember uh, when you are treating a case of nephrotic syndrome. Uh, that is in remission. When, uh, when you, will you label it as a case of remission? When urinary, urinary protein excretion is less than four milligram per square meter per hour, or urinary deep stick test, and that is nil per protein or trace for three consecutive days, then you can label it as a case of remission. But if the, uh, when will you label it as a case of relapse? When urinary protein excretion is more than 40 milligram per square meter per hour, or urinary deep test, more than two plus or for more than three consecutive days, then you can suspect probably this, there is a relapse of nephrotic syndrome. And when do you label it as a case of frequent relapse? When two or more relapse occurs within the six months of initial response or four or more relapse within 12 months period, then you will label it as a case of frequent relapses. And when you will label it as a case of steroid dependence, two consecutive relapse occurring during the period of steroid tapering or within 14 days of cessation. When um, you are uh, tapering the dose of steroid, but if the, if the symptoms and signs reappear, then you have to think probably this patient is steroid dependent. And when you will, will you label it as a case of steroid sensitive? Normalization of proteinuria within four weeks after the start of standard initial therapy with daily oral prednisolone. So uh, when the normalization of proteinuria with a standard uh, steroid therapy, daily oral prednisolone, if normalization occurs, then you will label it, this case is steroid sensitive. And steroid resistance reverse failure to achieve remission in spite of four weeks of standard prednisolone therapy, you will label it as a case of steroid resistance. So this is very important. Now comes to the 
management. Always the, in management, there are uh, two portions. One is symptomatic management, management and one is specific management. In case of symptomatic management, say if patient is edematous, then you can uh, give diuretics uh, along with uh, potassium sparing diuretics you can give. If there is hypoalbuminemia, you can give um, a, a protein rich diet, even albumin. If there is an infection, you can give antibiotic. And if uh, th there are other hematological features, you have to treat accordingly. So that will be the symptomatic tra treatment. But most important drug treatment is prednisolone. So this is very important. Initial dose is 60 milligram per square meter uh, body surface area per day, maximum 80 milligram per day for four weeks. After four weeks, it will taper the dose of steroid, and that will be 40 milligram per square meter body surface area for 48 hours, maximum 60 milligram uh, daily for further four weeks. Then, if there is a remission, then you will gradually withdraw the uh, steroids. So initial dose, you should remember. And in case of relapse, so if say after, um, after stopping the prednisolone, there is a relapse, then similarly, you will give 60 milligram per square meter body surface area per day, maximum 80 milligram per day until remission. Previously, we have given for four weeks. But in case of relapse case, you have to give initial dose. That is, say, if you give the 80 milligram daily until remission, until the urinary protein uh, comes to normal. And then you will taper the dose 40 milligram per square meter body surface area for 48 hours for four weeks. Then, if there is no urinary albumin or there is a remission criteria fulfilled, then you can withdraw the dose of prednisolone. But if there is a frequent relapse or extra dependent, long term, low dose prednisolone for two, three to six months, you can prescribe, by, um, uh, say 0.25 or 2.5 milligram per kg body weight, you can prescribe for, for a more prolonged period up to three to six months. So this algorithm is very important. You should note it very carefully. So in case of uh, when you are leveling a case as a nephrotic syndrome, initial diagnosis, you will prescribe prednisolone, as already we have mentioned, 60 milligram per square meter body surface area per day, maximum 80 milligram per day for four weeks. So if there is a response after four weeks, you will reduce the dose of prednisolone, that is a 40 milligram per square meter body surface area for 48 hours for four weeks. And if there is a remission, if there is no albumin in the urine, then gradually you will reduce the dose of steroid. And you have to taper the dose of steroid 25% uh, monthly over four months. Over four months, you have to reduce the dose. And after that, you will discontinue. But if there is a relapse, uh, as already we have mentioned, that is initial dose of prednisolone, that is 60 milligram per square meter body surface area per day, you will prescribe until remission. Then you will reduce the dose to 40 milligram per square meter body surface area for, for 48 hours for four weeks and then discontinue. But if there is a frequent relapse, you will reinduce re the drug of prednisolone as in step two and then taper and keep low dose alternate day. Low dose alternate day, prednisolone 0.1 to 1 to 0.5 milligram per kg, uh, per kg um, of the body weight for six months. Uh, in case of frequent relapse, you will prolong this maintenance dose for a prolonged period, up to six months. If patient relapse on, in spite of you giving prednisolone, or if uh, uh, if not steroid toxic, then consider cyclophosphamide. That is cumulative, cumulative dose is 168 milligram per kg if steroid is toxic. Um, so you can give other drugs like cyclophosphamide. Even if there's a relapse in case of uh, post cyclophosphamide period, uh, or if steroid toxic, refer pediatric nephrologist to consider. 
or you can prescribe second dose or second course of cyclophosphamide or cyclosporin, cyclosporin therapy or other immunosuppressive drug. So this is in a nutshell the algorithm of treatment of nephrotic syndrome. But initially, if there is no response, then you have to do the renal biopsy to, biopsy to see the type of glomerulation whether it is a membranous nephropathy, whether it is a focal segmental glomerulosclerosis, whether any renal lupus, you have, to, uh, you have to confirm by renal biopsy if there is no response with steroid in initial therapy. Now, as I already mentioned, you have to give the symptomatic therapy. In case of generalized swelling, you can give the diuretics. In for blood pressure control, you can give the AC inhibitor or receptor blockers, you can give. In case of dyslipidemia, you can give the um, lipid loading agents, mainly atorvastatin or other drugs. In case of immunosuppressive therapy, uh, besides a steroid, you can give the cyclophosphamide or cyclosporine or tacrolimus or mycophenolate mofetil. And these are all the immunosuppressive therapy if a steroid is res not responsive, then you can give this drug. And what are the indication of renal biopsy? A renal biopsy is also not required prior to cytotoxic therapy. When you are uh, planning for uh, cytotoxic therapy, then you will advise for renal biopsy. In case of steroid resistance nephrotic syndrome, steroid are not working or not responsive, then you can. Um, uh, also advice for renal biopsy. In case of secondary nephrotic syndrome, as already mentioned, say in case of uh, SLE or other autoimmune disease or and even the uh, other uh, infective causes that you can advise. And in case of congenital nephrotic syndrome, you can advise the uh, renal biopsy. Now, uh, if you use the steroid for a prolonged period, there may be some side effects. Even steroid toxicity can occur. That is, stunting of the growth can occur of the children. There may be cataract, uh, uh, a presenal cataract can occur due to steroid therapy. There may be the abdominal stria, uh, you can get it. In case, in, and there may be the pushing guard features. That is rounded face, central obesity, tendency to bruise more easily, and hirsutism. And this Cushing syndrome can occur due to the hydrogenic steroid for a prolonged period. If you use a steroid for a prolonged period, there may be osteopenia or osteoporosis. Even if you use prednisolone 7.5 milligram daily for more than three months, there may be osteopenia or osteoporosis. There may be also proximal myopathy can occur and recurrent infection due to low immunity. You always think this is also a, a, a immunosuppressive condition. So there may be recurrent infection can occur. So th these are the features you can get it in a case of prolonged steroid therapy. That is hydrogenic Cushing. You can get it. That is moon face, red cheek. There may be bruising. There may be buffalo harm. There is a thin skin, there may be high blood pressure and thin arms and legs, and, uh, and, but abdomen is swollen. There may be the red stria, pendulous abdomen, then uh, poor wound healing. Patient may also develop diabetes. Patient may also develop hypertension. There may be also osteoporosis. Even vertebral, multiple vertebral fracture can occur. The codfish like vertebra can occur due to compressed vertebra in osteoporosis. These can occur in a prolonged steroid therapy. So, uh, in case of edematous state, uh, bed rest actually uh, should be avoided because, as already we have mentioned, there is a tendency of hypergoglobulinity. So, uh, and there may be a prothrombotic state, coagulation uh, cascade may be increased. So, patient should be mobile as far as possible. In case of dietary advice, no added salt, normal protein with educate calories. Added salt can be, uh, should be avoided because it will retain more fluid and patient will be more edematous. Prophylactic antibiotic, oral penicillin, particularly in during gloves with gross edema. 
if you suspect that this patient may develop infection, then you can advise oral penicillin. In case of hypovolemia, infuse sulfur albumin or 5% albumin you can give. Plasma protein derivatives or human plasma you can give in case of hypoalbuminemia. And you can give diuretics uh, if uh, urine output is less and patient is edematous, blood pressure is normal, then you can give diuretics. Even you can give combination diuretics you can give. And you have also, to, uh, also you have to treat the complication. Say if there is infection, then you can give the parental penicillin or penicillin group of drugs. Even you can give the third generation cephalosporin in case of primary per peritonitis, that is septorexone, cefixim, and others. If exposed to chicken pox and measles, varicella joster immunoglobulin should be given within 72 hours after exposure to chicken pox. Single dose of intravenous immunoglobulin can be given. If patient is exposed to say measles or chicken pox, then you can give this. In case of uh, uh, that is if there is any thrombosis, say renal vein thrombosis or any other evidence of thrombosis, you can give anticoagulant, that is warfarin, low dose aspirin, dipyramidal, all have been used to minimize the risk of clot. Actually, low dose aspirin and dipyramidal, these are the antiplatelet agent. If you suspect that this patient can develop thrombotic state, then you can advise aspirin, 75 to 100 milligram daily, you can give. If there is a, any aspirin uh, sensitivity, then you can give clopidogrel or dipyridomal, you can give. But in a case of established thrombosis, you have to give anticoagulant, warfarin, low dose, um, that is low molecular weight heparin, anoxaparin, or even heparin, you can give. In a case of established uh, thrombotic condition, Urine albumin monitoring is very important. This is a very uh, simple test, but very important in monitoring of the patient. It is advocated that monitoring of urine albumin excretion to be done regularly, either at home with urine deep stick test or at the nearest health center, because you can assess whether patient is in remission, whether uh, whether patient can uh, be. Uh, be in a, in a prolonged remission period. So simple urinary um, albumin test is important. Uh, you have to do it uh, initially frequently, then at a certain interval, you can do this simple urine test. Patient education is very important part in the management. Parents and school teachers should be provided with, with information regarding the disease, which include advice and precaution of infection. Say there is uh, any any uh, cut injury, there may there may be any uh, infection in the skin, or there may be sore throat. So in that particular case, the doctor should be consulted because they may require antibiotics. Dangers of sudden steroid withdrawal, that is adrenal crisis. You cannot withdraw the steroids suddenly; uh, otherwise, there may be adrenal crisis. You have to taper the dose gradually, slowly, slowly you have to taper. Immunization is also important because these patients are very much uh, prone to develop infection. While the child is on corticosteroid treatment and within six weeks after cessation, only killed vaccine may be safely be administered to the child. Live vaccine can be administered six weeks after cessation of corticosteroid therapy because uh, in case of live vaccine, if patient is uh, on a steroid, there may be also some uh, flare of that particular uh, particular um, uh, that is uh, the uh, uh, that is either you, if you are giving the uh, vaccination for bacterial uh, bacteria, bacteria and others that may be may cause uh, uh, even uh, flare up due to uh, uh, steroid. So. Oh. You have to care for it. live vaccine so that, so that live vaccine only can be administered six weeks after cessation of the corticosteroid therapy. So this is also important. Now comes to the what about the prognosis? In case of minimal chain lesion, these patients are mostly sensitive and mostly come comes back to the normal position. 
So in case of idiopathic nephrotic syndrome, ester sensitive is 90%, but ester resistance is 10% cases. So this patient actually revert back to normal. If there is a frequent relapse or steroid dependent can occur in 50% uh, cases, um, that is steroid resistance, they may ultimately uh, progress to end stage renal failure. If there is infrequent relapses, 33% uh, can occur, infrequent relapse, then you have to treat accordingly. If, and no relapse actually in this particular group of patients, 25%. But remember, most of the cases of minimal chain lesion usually they usually comes back to normal. So there is no requirement of renal biopsy. You have to try with a steroid. Even you can give um, a frequent uh, two to three times you can give, and then you can give other immunosuppressive drug like cyclophosphamide and others. If steroid is not responsive, then you have to go for the renal biopsy and other treatment modality. But you have to closely monitor whether this patient goes into chronic uh, uh, chronicity, that is end stage renal failure or not. So you see, before treatment, before treatment, that that is the um, uh, there is a swelling of the face, leads are also swollen. There is a puffiness of the face. And after treatment, it comes to normal. Um, probably it is a case of minimal lesion changes. So this is all about uh, today's lecture. And so if you have any question, uh, you can ask.